We all have those calls that haunt us. You know, there's not a 911 dispatcher alive who doesn't have at least one that sticks with them for the rest of their lives. And hell, most have too many to count. I always thought I was above that. And I never let this job or those calls get to me. I was tough. And then September 12th happened. I worked the night shift at a very rural county sheriff's office, a little over 1,200 square miles with a population of 31,000. Not a lot in the way of heinous crimes happened. You know, there's, there were these out-of-the-ordinary UFO calls every now and then, but most of the time it was loose cows, car, deer accidents. I sure do have a share of crazies. Um, that night... That night, my caller was one of them. It's about 3.01 in the morning. My partner, Anna, and I were watching reruns of 90 Day Fiance when the 911 call tones went off. Totally routine. Okay, I try to answer the phone faster than Anna because she has the quickest hands in the West when it comes to call taking, and unfortunately, this time I got it. County 911, what's the address of your emergency? Silence. Hello, County 911? More silence. I look to my call screen where the coordinates are, updating the call. It's, it's finally phases to the correct coordinates to map roughly where the call is. Hello, County 911, what is your emergency? I repeat again, entering the coordinates in. It maps to a residence in our second largest city, and immediately I know who our caller is. Marjorie Cannonberry. Don't let her name fool you, she's not a sweet old lady. Rather, a 32-year-old drug user. Extensive history in our house records. Didn't even need to look her up. In my three years of dispatching here, I don't recall just one week where I didn't have a call with Marjorie. Hello, Marge. Do you have an emergency? I ask again. We're on first name basis. Yes. I finally hear her whisper. Okay, what's going on? There's... She pauses. Her breathing trembling slightly. There's something in my closet. There's someone in your closet? I asked, quickly typing into my call narrative. How do you know they're there? Do you see them? No. No, not someone. She whispered again. I could tell she was truly terrified. Something. I don't know what it is. Okay. At this point, I'm convinced Marge is having another drug-induced hallucination. It wouldn't be the first time. Describe to me what it looks like. In the background, Anna is dispatching our area deputy. Please send someone, Marge whispered. Yeah, I have a deputy on the way, Marge, but I need you to tell me what you're seeing, I said. When you said something, what did you mean? It's tall, she said. It has to bend over to fit, and it... And it has long claws. She paused. I could hear her sniffling. She was definitely crying. It's tapping them on the floor. Can you hear them? She paused, and I listened carefully to see if I could actually hear anything. And maybe it was my imagination, but I thought just... Just barely I could hear a rhythmic tapping. Did you hear them? She asked almost desperately, like she was begging me to believe her. I ignored her question. What else, Marge? What else do you see? Um, it's, it's all black, and it really, it has really big teeth. It keeps licking its teeth like it wants to eat me. So it knows you're there? Yes, she said shakily. It's staring right at me. Glowing yellow eyes. For the first time in my life, a shiver went down my spine from her words. Every horror movie I've ever seen came to mind, though I knew better. My supernatural bone was peaked. Could there, could there really be a demon in her closet? Are you able to leave the room, Marge? I asked, typing all this into our dispatch narrative. Can you go outside until my deputy gets there to see what's in there? I don't think so. If I move, it'll kill me. Have you been drinking tonight, Marjorie? 
I know how incriminating it sounds, but it was a legitimate clarification question. Call me heartless if you want to. No. Please believe me. I know I've, I've, I've done stupid things before. This is real. I haven't been drinking. I haven't, I haven't taken anything recently. I don't know what it is. I'm scared. It keeps tapping its claws. You have to hear them, don't you? The phone cracked as she held it out at arm's length. There was no mistaking this time. I could hear something tapping. A pit formed in my stomach. What the hell? It, it was like the sound of long acrylic fingernails. Okay, okay, Marge. I'm going to stay on the phone with you until my deputy gets there. I looked to our mapping software. He's not super far out, so it shouldn't it shouldn't be much longer. Okay, thank you. It's just staring at me. Does it have a face? I ask, against my better judgment. I mean, did I actually believe there was something there? Yes. But it's all teeth, like it's smiling. And it hasn't moved since you saw it. No. No, it's just been here. Staring. Tapping its claws. How long has it been there? I don't know. I woke up to the tapping noise and just saw it there, so I called you right away. You don't believe me, do you? It's not that I don't believe you, Marge, I answered. It's just... I, I, I've i never heard of this sort of thing before. What you're describing sounds like a demon from a horror movie. How do you think it is? Another shiver. Her voice sounded so convincing, real or not, she was she was legitimately seeing something, whether it was an actual demon or a hallucination. Part of me felt bad for her, being absolutely convinced something like like what she described was staring at her. It would be horrifying. Marge suddenly gasped as the phone rustled as it went from her hand. What's going on, Marge? I asked quickly, my tone dropping in seriousness. It's coming towards me! Oh god, it's claws! Please help! My deputy's almost there, Marge, I said loudly over her screams, but I doubt she heard me. See, if I hadn't been freaked out by then, I, I was now. Those, those blood-curdling screams were one of pure and unfiltered terror. It was like I was listening to someone whose life was coming to an end in the most violent way possible. And my pulse was flying as I was trying to type everything I heard into the call. Next to me, Anna was relaying the information to our deputy. Come on, I thought. Get there already. The problem with a rural county was that we didn't have as many deputies as others, but our response time was significantly longer. This, this... This particular night, the city's officer had called in sick, so it was it was the county's job to cover it if there were any calls. 1303, be advised she's screaming and not answering us anymore, Tasha said to our responding deputy. 1303, 10 4, two minutes out. 1308 to dispatch, I'll be there at 1076 as well. Our other unit in the area piped up. I had seen him making his way towards the area before, but now he was going emergent. I repeatedly tried to get Marge to come back on the phone, but all I could hear was her screams. I could also hear things being thrown around like she was like she was smashing them with her body, and suddenly, as quick as it happened, everything went silent. Marge? Marge, are you there? The phone crackled. He's going to kill me. He knows who you are. You're next. And then the line went dead. If I had a handset phone, it would have fallen out of my hand. Um, how would anyone not get unnerved by something like that? The, the movie lover in me was terrified. You're next? 1303 dispatch on 1023. The first responding deputy advised that he was on scene. His name was Jason, our youngest deputy in the department. A super nice kid who's probably the best person that could have responded to help Marge. Anna held radio traffic just for that call. And we waited for what seemed like an eternity as Jason went into the house. 1303 dispatch. It nearly made me jump out of my seat, my nerves on edge. Get a med rolling. She's, um, she's cut up her arms pretty bad. Within five minutes, our med unit was rolling. Jason and Trevor, his backup, ended up chaptering Marge. They came up before Jason transferred her to the mental hospital after getting medical clearance, and 
explaining everything that had happened. Apparently Marge was tripping out on drugs, that's my first suspicion, and decided to cut her arms with razor blades. She'd also trashed her apartment in her drug stupor, which was explaining the crashing around her that I heard. What was the tapping? I asked. I heard the tapping she was talking about. I don't know about that, Jason said with a shrug. Probably something she was doing that she didn't realize she was doing. Yeah, yeah, no, you're probably right, I said, but... I I, I couldn't shake the bad feeling. Sad, honestly, Jason said, retrieving the papers off the printer that he was printing. So fried from drugs, she's just crazy now. I glanced out of the dispatch window to the lobby where Trevor was sitting with Marge. She sat with her head hung down and her arms in bandages. And seeing someone hopped up on drugs is always a little disturbing to me. As if she knew I was looking at her, she lifted her head. And her eyes met mine. They grew wide. As if she were about to, to be hit by a bus and she pointed at me. Letting out another piercing cry. Trevor stood up as she did, putting himself between her and me inadvertently. I couldn't shake the feeling that she wasn't pointing at me, but rather behind me. I told myself it was dumb, but... Why was it? I couldn't look over my shoulder. Jason flew out the door with the paperwork he needed, and they both struggled down to the front with her, load her up into the squad. In two days, hospital staff would find Marge dead in her room. Her head... Her head somehow twisted unnaturally around. Her death would never have a full explanation. Finally, after taking a deep breath, I turned around. There was nothing there. I I let out a breath that I didn't know I was holding and then laughed at myself. But of course there was nothing there. The rest of the shift went smoothly the whole 20 minutes we had left. When we finally left that night, I couldn't wait to go home and go to bed. That call really rattled me, left me with with a headache. I got back to my little apartment, greeted by my little white cat. After giving her more food, I took off my uniform, I hung it up in the closet, making sure that that I closed the doors. I hung it back to my bed, I jumped in, I turned on the TV for background noise. And that night I slept with the lights on. And maybe it was just my imagination running wild, or the stress of a long week, but... But as I closed the door into my closet... I could have sworn it was a pair of glowing yellow eyes staring back at me. I'm sure many of you have been to a newly remodeled McDonald's, maybe possibly one with a McCafe. But have you ever looked up why they started remodeling the restaurants in the first place? I mean, the first McCafe in the, uh, in the States popped up in Chicago back in May of 2001. That was just the beginning. Now, over the last five years, McDonald's has taken to remodeling every single restaurant in America. Most of you might even be asking yourselves why or how it's been so long since you last stepped foot in an old McDonald's. I mean, ask anyone who's done some market research and you'll hear something strange. McDonald's loses money in the process. That's a fact. And the new, the new furniture isn't pulling new customers and the McCafes can't sell coffee that cheap and turn a profit. I mean, look at Starbucks prices. You'll see what I mean. Stakeholders say that they wanted a more adult vibe for the restaurant, a classier look for a classier America. Wrong answer. Google it right now. What's McDonald's target age group? It's children and teens. Always has been. So then why? Why do they start all those remodels? Why would one of the largest corporations in America spend over $1 billion on a terrible marketing strategy? Well, you see, that's where things get interesting. Let's start with the play places. If you can remember, almost no two play places at McDonald's were identical. Some of them were really fun. I know I had a few favorites. But some of them were also really dangerous. The first gym I could find was a carousel play place in Lancaster, Pennsylvania back in the 1980s, when they got shut down mere months after opening. Little information was given about why they closed. The lot's been vacant ever since. If you find the right connections in Lancaster, though, you might, might be able to read an article that didn't make it to print. Children would play on the merry-go-round in ways that they weren't supposed to. See, they're kids, so of course they would. Well, one day, a few kids managed to crawl underneath the thing, but then, they never made it back out. 
The whole incident was so heavily guarded by McDonald's PR that you'd have trouble finding a single person that was ever there that whole afternoon. The only witness anyone could find has this to say. When they went under, a few parents started calling for help. Then, something happened to the lights. The carousel kept getting brighter and the music was deafening. I ran out of the building when the machine started to smoke, but I looked back through the window to see if the kids were all right and the employees were just standing there behind the registers. They looked like they were still waiting for customers. Weirder and weirder stories pick up from there throughout the years. Reports of children sinking into ball pits that should have been one foot deep. Mothers searching play tubes for their kids, only to find a lonely pair of shoes. But the play places held a mere fraction of the incidents. Back in 1996 in Knoxville, Tennessee, there was a businessman of his 40s who went into a McDonald's restroom and remained there for several hours. Patrons noted that he refused to leave the furthest back stall. The police were finally called and they managed to break down the door. He was restrained by paramedics as he wouldn't willingly leave the restroom. As they pulled him out of the stall, he began screaming bloody murder, take me back, I want to go back. But the moment he exited the restaurant, he passed out. He had no memory of ever going to a McDonald's the day of the incident. The restaurant was shut down before anyone could inspect the stall that he had shut himself in. However, anyone who used the restroom that day mentioned hearing several voices whispering things like it wasn't him. We have to go back. Saw you smile. Then there was a fry cook somewhere in Vermont back in 1999 who walked into the middle of the restaurant and dumped scalding oil on himself without flinching or saying a word. Several of the customers started to laugh and roll around in the burning oil alongside him and were rushed to the hospital. Only one survived, but refused to make a statement. Not that she easily could. Her throat melted all the way through and had to be completely restructured. The manager claimed he didn't remember ever hiring the fry cook and that he wasn't in any official paperwork. His name tag didn't even have a name, just hashtags written on it. Once again, the McDonald's was closed without a trace. Most of the stories sounded like urban legends to me, but it never failed. Whenever I found a story, a McDonald's had been shut down in its wake. Near the late 2000s, the number of cover-ups had been so frequent that McDonald's decided to shut all of them down and rebuild. Every single one. But of course, they'd miss a few. I needed to see one for myself. I remember going in the old McDonald's as a kid, but that was before the frequency of the incidents. That was when it was still safe. There was a small town on the way to my parents' house just off the highway. Oroska was its name. Maybe a hundred residents, completely untouched by the outside world. Practically forgotten. It was pointless to stop there for any normal reason because there wasn't a gas station or a rest stop, not even a sign to let you know that you were close. Let's just say I had to sneak my way around some very old building permits to discover that they had one of the few McDonald's aside from some treasured landmarks that has yet to go through a remodel since the 1970s. How lucky is that? I was surprised they even had a fast food place, yet they didn't have a market or a post office. I planned a trip to my parents' place for the weekend, with a stop at Orozca on the way. It was already dark outside since it was the dead of winter, and I didn't get off till five. I was cold and grumpy about driving at night, but mostly determined. I don't think I ever would have found the place before the phone GPS. The turnoff from the highway was just a dirt road with no landmarks or anything. As I pulled into the town, none of the houses had lights on. Most of the street lights were out as well, as if nobody had remembered to change the light bulbs in years. This place really was untouched. I'd be surprised if most of the residents had moved out or simply died off. It definitely had the markings of a ghost town anyway. I was about to lose hope when I finally saw it. The nauseous yellow light of those golden arches illuminating a vacant parking lot in the distance. It buzzed and flickered like a fly zapper running out of batteries. The sign below said, Eat New Eggs McUffin. We like to saw you smile. Which I assumed was just a lazy teen's handiwork. I pulled into the lot and carelessly parked my car in the center. There's nobody else there anyway. When I stepped out of my car, I felt a squish under my foot. It was a burger covered in mold with a rancid liquid oozing out. The smell was absolutely vomit-worthy. I jumped out to scrape the contents of the burger from my shoe when I noticed the whole parking lot was covered in trash. 
There were half-eaten boxes of fries and sun-baked children's toys spilling out of old greased-up McDonald's bags. Everything was mixed with the dirt and snow like it had been there for months, possibly years. I hurried across the lot to avoid retching all over the asphalt. As I approached the door, I noticed the windows were caked in dust. Somebody had taped a piece of paper over the door with the words closed, scribbled across it in red marker, yet the sign hung from the inside, clearly saying open. Cautiously, I approached the door and pushed. An artificial bell hummed in an old McDonald's tune that fizzled out on the last few notes as the door creaked open. I looked around the fluorescent lit room and saw it was void of life. There was nobody sitting at any of the tables, nobody attending the registers. Someone had left a tray on one of the tables in the back, but there was no other sign someone had been there. The inside was at least a little cleaner. Toys on display by the counter were of children, of characters that I'd never heard of, likely from before my time. The whole place was covered in faded coats of yellow and red paint, and all the tables had the classic McDonald's wood finish. The wood looked completely rotten, but slathered with coats of polish as a sad attempt to keep it looking new. All of it had a sort of green hue, which I contributed to the old lights. The most noticeable element, though, was a terrible burning plastic smell that stung my nose. I went up to the register. I felt like I shouldn't order anything, but I was hoping maybe I could ask someone a few questions. I waited for a good 15 minutes in silence. I shouted hello with only a muted echo for a response. I had been to a few McDonald's with bad service in the past, but this was insane. With how dirty the whole place was, I should have expected as much. Just as I was about to turn around and give up, the cash register popped open. It was practically begging me to take a tip for myself. And besides, didn't I deserve a slight reward for wasting my time here? So I casually walked over to it and I saw at least a dozen twenties stacked high. Looking around to make sure nobody was watching, I... I reached in to take a few bills when the thing suddenly snapped closed right on my fingers. The metal dug deep into my flesh, leaving a dark trail of blood down the side of the counter. I yelped in pain, and behind the counter at the other end of the grill was a first aid kit hanging on the wall. The lights were burned out in the kitchen area, but I needed a bandage pronto. I hopped over the table, I made my way to the back, and the burning smell was getting stronger as I walked. I noticed the grill was covered in a thick layer of grease, completely unsuitable for cooking. I passed by the frying station, and the oil was filled to the top with maggots. I quickened my walk to the first aid, hoping that I'd get patched up and out of there as soon as possible. I started to realize this restaurant was definitely not open for business anymore. Probably shouldn't have entered in the first place. I opened up the first aid kit and had to swallow that vomit. A cloud of mold burst out from it in every direction, followed by that same bubbling black ooze that was on the burger outside. I started coughing and waving my hand in the air to clear the mold dust floating around. The same bell I heard playing at that McDonald's tune started up again as I steadied myself. I assumed it was broken like the rest of this dump. I looked back towards the counter and noticed everything seemed farther away. I must have been disoriented from losing blood and that awful smell. I, I looked down at my hand to see how bad the wound was and my... And my eyes widened. There wasn't any wound on my hand at all. I rushed back towards the counter in a panic when something under the stove caught my foot and I fell. In the darkness, my eyes started to adjust and I saw the outline of a body. Someone was under there. Maybe maybe they were unconscious. They, maybe they needed help. I yanked at the person's arm and a half-decayed body slid out across the floor. They, they were wearing McDonald's employee shirts with a name tag that just read the hashtags off. Their mouth was contorted into a sickening grin, but their eyes, their eyes were screaming. I, I tried to shout, but no sound came out. Like when they tried to wake up from a nightmare, as I, as I scrambled to get back up to the counter, the light started to dim and the McDonald's tune got louder. The notes fizzled and distorted as they were playing. And once I had gotten my grip above the counter, I froze. Since entering, I never looked at the side of the restaurant opposite the counter. There was a play place. The glass separating the main restaurant from the play area had hundreds of bloody handprints smeared down towards the floor. The, the tube slide was caved in with chunks of red liquid squirting out from the tiny holes left at the bottom. The, there were rows of nooses tied to the monkey bars in the corner, with employees wearing that same hashtag name tag hanging from them. The tables around the perimeter had skeletons with rotting food left in the trays, some of the food hanging from the skulls' mouths, and I looked on in horror, too shocked to move. While the rest of the restaurant went dark, a bulb in the center of the play place continued to glow like a, like a carnival spotlight. 
and below it, a massive ball pit, barely able to contain all of its colored plastic balls. It was smoking under the blaring white light, making that awful burning plastic smell. The balls began to rattle and fall off the edge when something inside started shuffling around. I, I wanted to run so badly, but my body refused, and then suddenly, suddenly the music went dead and the movement stopped. A yellow glove slowly crept upward from the ball pit, writhing its fingers as it went. A connected red and white sleeve came after it, slowly alternating in colors as they appeared from underneath. The arm continued to reach towards the sky, growing more and more while its joints popped and cracked like breaking branches. By the end, that arm had to be at least six feet long. It finally reached for the light bulb on the ceiling with its gangly gloved fingers and began to twist it loose. I broke into a sprint, jumping over the counter and toppling chairs as I went. That last light went out just as I got to the exit. I bashed through the door, breaking the glass in the process. As I rolled into the parking lot, I heard a distant scream. And then something whispered right next to my ear in dead silence. It had that same tinny distortion as the McDonald's tune. Come back. I want to see you smile. I am. Um, I haven't told anyone about what happened there that night. There was an article online saying Orozco burned to the ground a few days later. I don't know if it was a cover-up or something else, but um, I'm never going back to find out. So I didn't share this because I want you to get involved, by the way. I shared it to warn you what happens when you do. You can go to a new McDonald's, you know, keep your... Keep getting your Big Macs, keep getting your McAfee coffees, that's fine. They did something to, to the remodels, they made them safe, at least for now. But don't ever go into an old McDonald's. Not even the drive through Okay, I've, I've got to stop now. I need to get the pain meds. My jaw hurts, and that, the hand that I snapped at the register is getting so itchy. Like many new parents, I first became acquainted with the various baby shark melodies through autoplay on YouTube. My daughter Maya was only two weeks old when we went through a rough bout of colic. I tried to soothe her by rocking, swaddling, and cluster feeding, but nothing worked. On one particularly difficult night, I felt like I was losing my mind, so, so I searched for baby songs online and just picked up the first playlist that popped up. I continued to walk around the room, rocking her to the rhythm of familiar childhood songs like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star or Itsy Bitsy Spider and others. The playlist didn't stop her from crying, but it cheered me up a little and drowned out my fussy baby's relentless screams. And then something miraculous happened. The slow version of Baby Shark came on and Maya stopped crying. She gazed up at the ceiling with an odd expression, her tiny mouth twitching a little first hint of a smile. From that day on, my daughter loved everything Baby Shark, including alternative versions like Halloween Shark, Santa Shark, and so on. It was around this time that my parents took a trip to South Korea. Aside from soaking their bone in the Busan Hot Springs, they spent a lot of time walking the promenade, exploring unique food stalls and street shops, and in one of these shops, they found a yellow Baby Shark toy. They bought it off the local vendor in a heartbeat, happy to have found a souvenir for their tiny granddaughter. To say that it was love at first sight is to say nothing at all. My daughter's first laugh was at her new plushie friend. She knew who Baby Shark was before she recognized words like Mama and Dada. We sleep trained her in one night thanks to this soft, pillow-like texture. When she first rolled over, it was to get closer to the toy, because he'd slipped out of reach. My daughter, just over a year old now, and for... Every major milestone, vacation trip, and family photo session, Baby Shark has never left her side. It was super cute at first. Lots of babies have loveys, and it's a great relief to parents when there's a surefire way to stop crying with a toy or a cartoon. However, I began to notice some weird things about the toy. Like, like it was almost never where I thought I left it. At first, I didn't pay much attention because whenever Maya started crying, I'd just be relieved that Baby Shark was within arm's reach. When she grew out of her fussier phase, I realized that he was never in a different room from my daughter. This was weird because I'd picked her up and carry her around to different rooms for diaper changes, for baths, for playtime, and mealtimes. My wife blamed this husband brain I have, and I rationalized it away. Like with all her milestones, we were super excited when Maya first started babbling. But 
My joy quickly turned to dread when I watched videos of other newborns' first babbles. See, they were all primitive attempts at making p, b, m noises. My daughter sounded like she was actually talking with an intonation scale. You know, sometimes accompanied by laughter and hand-waving. All this at just four months. I mean, I, I, as you might have guessed, she only ever babbled at Baby Shark. And once again, and once again, my wife thought that I was being paranoid. We have a genius baby and you're just trying to hate, she said. And I kept my suspicions to myself after that. I mean, sometimes I'd check the baby monitor after bedtime and see the, the toy glowing like a nightlight. You know, only to blink and find everything looking normal a second later. During the day, I often felt like I was being watched. Particularly if I went breaking dad, allowing too much screen time, cussing out loud, uh, browsing social media instead of playing with Maya or doing chores. Whenever I did anything like that, I'd feel the usual prickle of, you know, the parent guilt. And then something more sinister. See, I'd look up and I'd see Baby Shark nearby, staring me down. Whenever this happened, small punishments would follow, like, like I'd, I'd like stub my toe, or crack my phone screen, or knit myself shaving. It was never serious. And just maybe it was only a coincidence, but it didn't feel like it. You know, I was I was severely creeped out. Was this some weird hallucinatory strain of, of depression? I, mean, I needed to get a grip. Stay-at-home parenting was taking a toll. Two months ago, my wife went away on a business trip to San Diego. I was so not in the mood to handle a teething baby on my own for a week. I switched on YouTube. I put Maya and Baby Shark in the playpen in front of the TV so that I can get some tidying done. Popping my earpods in, I busied myself with housework while listening to a podcast. I'd check with Maya every five to ten minutes to make sure that everything was okay. She was just fine, entranced by the screen, safely secured in her play area. I'll admit that I took longer to clean than was strictly necessary. I finished up by taking out the trash. Just as I was going back inside, a college friend called me. A girl we'd housed with had just posted a trashy picture on Facebook, and my friend wanted me to see it before it got deleted. And I was glued to my phone for a good 20 minutes after that, gossiping. And when I finally got back to the living room, I felt that familiar pang of guilt. I didn't want to look, but it was right there. Baby Shark's stitched black eyes bore into me, accusing me of being a selfish, inattentive father. I got really angry. I'm, enough was enough. Why was this toy making me get defensive when I did nothing wrong? I grabbed the stupid thing and I took it upstairs to the nursery. I delighted in slamming the toy chest shut on his goofy, toothy grin. I hesitated before going back downstairs, half convinced that I'd find the yellow fiend back in the same spot, but, but Maya's wails from the living room assured me that she didn't have her friend at her side. My daughter was hysterical, but I had had enough. This was getting ridiculous. She should be able to get through an evening without a silly shark toy. Maya's attachment to the thing was just unhealthy at this point. After, after a giant tantrum, she finally calmed down. We had dinner, we took a bath, read our favorite bedtime book, and I put her to bed. Without Baby Shark, it was like the colic had come back in full swing. I went back downstairs as she screamed and screamed. I decided to let her cry it out just this once. I was furious with Baby Shark for having so much pull, but I mean... More honestly, I was disgusted with myself and my, my crappy behavior that morning. After a few minutes of self-reflection, I, I understood that I was mistreating my daughter because of some utterly bizarre insecurity. I was just about to go back up to the nursery and reunite Maya with her lovey when I glanced at my worst nightmare coming to life on the baby monitor. I mean, no amount of horror movies or scary stories or news reports can, can prepare you for the sight of your infant child in grave danger. The terror that coursed through my body made me realize that I would endure a thousand more tantrums, relish in the worst teething nightmares, wash up countless diaper blowouts with a smile on my face if only I could prevent the abduction taking place in front of my eyes. There was a tall, dark figure standing at the foot of the bed trying to grab Maya as she darted around her crib cot. Luckily, she had already learned to walk while holding on to something, so the intruder was struggling to get a hold of her. There was no time to call for help. I sprinted upstairs into Maya's nursery. Without even thinking, I grabbed the hall lamp and flung it at the stranger's head as soon as I entered the room. I only grazed him, but the, the distraction caused him to stumble back, buying me a split second to shove the creep further away, grab Maya, and run out. 
I could feel the pursuer hot at my heels until I got to the head of the stairs and he tripped behind us. The last thing I heard was the man screaming as I ran downstairs and out of the house. I jogged over to the neighbors next door with Maya crying in my arms. The police discovered a peculiar scene in our house. The man was gone, but there was uh, there were signs of a bloody struggle in the hallway upstairs. I was allowed to go inside and fetch some of Maya's things so that so we could stay with my parents while the police investigated the crime scene. A senior detective escorted me, asking me elaborate questions about our day. He asked if I'd recognized the man, but I hadn't. I'd barely gotten a glimpse, and he seemed entirely ordinary. No one I would think about twice if I'd met him on the street. I mean, only, only after answering all the detective's questions did I realize that I'd forgotten to lock the front door after taking out the trash. The intruder must have slipped inside while I was on the phone, gone upstairs to hide in one of the closets, and what he planned to do from there on is made clear by the content of the bicycle bag that he dropped. Police officers found duct tape, a carving knife, and one of Maya's onesies inside, the one we'd given away to charity weeks ago. A pale-faced young officer emerged from the nursery as the detective and I approached. You need to see this, sir, he said, swallowing loudly. The detective allowed me to enter the nursery, where two other policemen were laying flat on the floor, shining their torches under Maya's crib cot. A crime scene photographer dropped down to take some shots of the mysterious scene, and as soon as he finished, one of the officers pulled a large, mangled foot out from under the bed. The room fell into hushed amazement. Does um, the senior detective look bewildered? Does that look like it's been chewed off? I didn't need to see any more. I quickly gathered my things and I looked for Baby Shark. And for once, for once, he had remained in the right place, inside the toy trunk. There was a slight difference, though, but I paid it no mind. Nothing a little cold water and ammonia couldn't handle. <laughs> Cute shark toy, the officer commented as I walked out of the house. I love the, the blood spatter pattern, he laughed. Thanks, I called back as I went to rejoin my parents and Maya downstairs. This has been Parents Watch Out for Baby Shark by Daria Vasileva. No one ever moves away from my town. When people leave, sure. For a weekend, or a week, even a month. But they always come back. And if you're born here, you die here. I'll call the town Grand View, even though it's not its name, for your safety and mine. It's a small Midwestern city with a few nice parks and a pretty good community college that everyone goes to. It's flourished through the 21st century, while a lot of nearby towns have lost people and jobs. We were even mentioned in the New York Times last year as a rare Rust Belt success story. They credited our prosperity to family-owned corporations here choosing not to leave, but truth is nobody leaves. Even young kids know this. In most places, hearing so-and-so move to the big city isn't cause for alarm. In Grandview, it's slang for committing suicide. There's no ambiguity because nobody moves to any big city. Even so, most people don't feel trapped here. I didn't. Until recently. Growing up in Grandview, I assumed that I'd stick around like everyone else. Yeah, I went to the local college. After graduating, got a job bartending at one of the hangout spots. I also performed there every Friday night with my band. It's our lead singer and guitarist. We're a cut-rate version of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, but at the time, I thought that we were incredible. It's cliche, but I dreamed of making it big as a musician in a large city. I broached the subject with our drummer, Ronnie, one Friday night after our show. We were carrying Ronnie's kick drum off the stage together, and he looked up at me in surprise. Leave town? He asked. Nobody ever leaves Grandview. I dropped the topic, but the thought of wasting my potential in Grandview aided me. Two months later, I'd lease an apartment in Chicago, figuring I'd find a job once I got there. Everyone I knew was shocked by my plans, but most were ultimately supportive, my parents included. The day I packed up my beat-up Toyota Corolla, they came out to my apartment to say goodbye. My dad chewing his lip and saying, I love you, just be careful. I was born here and I never left. He thought for a moment, Nobody ever leaves Grandview. I know, Dad, and I will. 
As I was lifting the last suitcase into the back seat, an older man passed by on the sidewalk. I was sure I'd seen him around the neighborhood, but couldn't remember speaking to him before. You taking a trip? He asked. Moving to Chicago, I announced, a little defiantly. The man smiled slightly and cocked his head. Don't you know? He said. Nobody ever leaves Grandview. My dad laughed. Yeah, I said. I've heard. I made it to Chicago, but I never found a job. Three weeks after I arrived, I got a phone call from my mother. She'd been diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer, and, and she wouldn't be getting better. I moved back home as soon as I could, telling myself I could leave again some other time. My mother lived for two more years. See, it was an immensely challenging period for me and my family, and I don't know if I'll ever really um, move past it. The only bright spot during this time was reconnecting with Catherine, an old high school crush. I ran into her at a bar and was surprised to learn that she remembered me. When we started dating, she became my source of strength through my mother's illness. A year after my mother's passing, we were engaged. Last week, two weeks before our wedding day, I had a panic attack. I was awake at 2 a.m., Catherine sleeping soundly next to me, and I felt the walls closing in. I remember my first night in Chicago and the fear I felt in the unfamiliar place, cut off from everyone and everything I knew. At the time, I'd been tempted to drive back home, but, but now I was worried that I'd never experienced that kind of fear again. I could see my life laid out neatly before me, starting a family with Catherine, drinking with Ronnie and the band. It was the same life as everyone else in Grandview, and I'd been so close to something different. I couldn't stay. I left the room as quickly and quietly as I could, grabbing clothes and toiletries and tossing them in a suitcase. I stuffed the suitcase into my car and I pulled out of the driveway onto the deserted late night roads. I was almost at the edge of town when I saw him. The silhouette of a man standing in the middle of the street. There was, there was no way around him, so I stopped and cautiously cracked my window. He walked around to the side of the car. Do you mind unlocking the passenger side door, Mr. Abrams? There are things I need to discuss with you. I didn't recognize the man, but somehow he knew my name. He wore a dark gray trench coat and thin matching gloves. He was bald, save for a horseshoe of white hair around the back of his head. I, I couldn't say why, but he terrified me. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I stammered. I, I don't know who you are. I'll rephrase. The man spoke calmly as he pulled a handgun from his trench coat and pointed it at my forehead through the window. Would you mind unlocking the passenger side door, Mr. Abrams? There are things I need to discuss with you. When he climbed into the passenger seat, I recognized him as the man I'd seen just before leaving for Chicago. He was old, but not wrinkled. The skin on his face was stretched tight across his skull. His hands and arms were skeletal, as well as long, thin, and bony. His movements were unhurried. And when he spoke again, it was in the same deliberate way. He emphasized his words letting each one hang in the air for a moment before speaking the next. I'm surprised you would pull a stunt like this, he said. After what you did to your mother, is marrying the woman of your dreams not enough for you? Where is your gratitude? He paused while I gaped at him. I like your fiancé. I like your father. So I'm going to do something I don't... I don't usually do. I'm going to give you a choice. You could turn the car around and go home and never attempt to leave again. He lifted the gun, pressing it to the right side of my head before I could move. Or you could move to the big city. Period. The implication was clear. I'll make it look like a suicide. Blood pounded in my head and I could barely think, staring at the dark road through the windshield as if it could save me. The gun was cold against my skin and finally I asked, what do you mean? What What I did to my mother? The man didn't answer, only looking intently at me with a mixture of scorn and condescension. But I found I knew what he meant. She got sick because you moved away. I thought this irrationally many times before. Who are you? Again, no answer, only that icy stare. 
Why are you doing this to me? I sustain grand view, the man said. I've been doing it for a long time. He pressed the gun harder into my temple. There was nothing I could do, so I put the car back in the drive and I began a slow U-turn to head home. The man brought the gun to his lap, turning to watch the street. For a second, out of the corner of my eye, he looked different. I could see the white bone under his translucent skin. His, his eyes became two glowing embers. The car filled with the scent of rot, and I nearly jumped out of my seat in panic, and then the vision and the smell were gone as quickly as they'd come. Gradually, my terror turned to exhaustion. You can't stop every car, I said quietly. He kept his eyes on the road, scanning the darkness. Oh, I know, he said. He sounded bored, and then... And he pressed his foot onto the gas pedal with surprising strength and steered the car towards a nearby tree. They found me the next morning. There was no evidence anyone else had been in the car. The doctors say I'm very lucky, and they're right. I'll never walk again, but I... I should regain full use of my upper body. Catherine and I even joke that I was always a slower runner than her. But with me in a wheelchair, she'll never be able to keep up. She's been extremely supportive, as always, and believed me when I told her I was taking a casual nighttime drive and dozed off. My dad says I'm very lucky to be marrying her, and he's right, too. All in all, things could be worse. But now I know it's true. Nobody ever leaves Grandview. Pika, a tendency or craving to eat substances other than normal food, such as clay, plaster, or ashes, occurring during childhood or pregnancy, or as a symptom of disease. 16th July 2016 I didn't notice Gemma running to the toilet in the middle of the night. I, I woke to the sound of her dry heaves, but as I came to and saw the sliver of light escape from beneath the bathroom door, I knew it was her. I entered slowly and asked if she was okay. She stayed silent for a moment, catching her breath. I'm pregnant, she said. My body chilled at the news. Are you sure? I asked. Without taking her head out of the toilet bowl, she held up the pregnancy test. Are you going to say anything? She asked. As the news sunk in, the initial anxiety turned to excitement, and my smile grew. 30th July, 2016. When I got home from work, I cooked dinner. I did my best to steam the vegetables and grill the chicken, though I, I didn't do a good job. I think I may have overdone the broccoli, I said, taking a bite and feeling it turn to mush in my mouth. I know you like it all Dante. She used her fork to push the food around her plate. I'm really sorry. I did overcook it, didn't I? No, it's not that, she said, trailing off. I can make you something else if you like, I offered. She continued to play with her food. Hey. Gemma, if you could have any kind of food in the world, what would it be? She perked up. Watermelon and cream cheese. That is an odd combination, I replied, smirking. I don't know, I've been craving it all week. She pushed her fork into a piece of chicken and raised it to her mouth. She hesitated at first, then closed her eyes and chewed. Almost instantly, she rose from her chair and she ran to the sink, spitting out the slightly chewed meat. I, I, I'm so sorry. I didn't think that I cooked it that bad. I don't know what's wrong with me, she said before breaking down into tears. I got up and hugged her. It's okay, sweetheart. It's probably the pregnancy. I reached out a hand and caressed her stomach. You're growing a child in you. It's only natural you're gonna... not feel normal. <laughs> Do you want me to go out? I can get you that watermelon and cream cheese. No, that's silly, she said. I don't mind at all. I'll, I'll be back in 15 minutes. She stayed over the sink, and I left for the shops. The dog whined as he saw me put on my coat and get my keys. Don't worry, buddy. You'll get some chicken when I get back. He cocked his head to one side. He quietened down. I returned with the watermelon and cream cheese. Gemma was still nowhere to be seen. In the kitchen, our plates were now on the side, covered in cling film. 
The dog followed me in, wagging its tail. I took the plastic off my wife's plate, took out the chicken breast, ripping it up piece by piece. Ziggy jumped up eagerly and chomped down the meat. Hey, Gemma, I called up the stairs, holding a plate of fruit and cheese. Have you gone to bed? I heard nothing in response. When I reached the bedroom, I saw her sleeping. I placed the plate on the side table. Jeff, is that you? Yeah, yeah, I, I made you your food. She sat up. You went to bed early. I'm feeling exhausted. I handed her the plate. My god, that's amazing, she said, shoveling down the food as if she hadn't eaten in days. I took the plate and returned to the kitchen to eat my cold food and wash up. And by the time I returned, she was asleep. 29th August, 2016. We sat in the reception area, waiting for the doctor to call us in for our first scan. Gemma's leg jiggled with anticipation. It's gonna be all right, I said, rubbing her knee. Gemma Hamilton was read out in a robotic voice, and I saw her name on a small LCD screen on the other side of the room. She audibly winced as the cold gel was applied to her belly. Let's see how the little one is getting on, the female doctor said, looking away at the small black and white screen. She moved the device around, pressing harder than I expected. I wanted to tell her to be more gentle, not hurt the baby. There it is, she said, pointing out the screen. I don't see anything, Gemma said. Look, it's just there, I replied, seeing the small dot. No larger than a monkey nut. Gemma stayed silent, staring in awe at the child thing that was growing within her. This was the first time I really felt I was going to be a father. It was a proud day for me. 13th October, 2016. I had stopped at the grocery store on the way back home to pick up Gemma's latest craving. Steak, tartare, and ice cream. Just thinking about it made me heave. But this wasn't the worst she'd asked for. We had rice pudding and mayonnaise, uh, peanut butter and pickles, and raw eggs. So, today felt like just another day. I placed the groceries in the kitchen. The night was drawing in, but it wasn't dark yet. I saw Gemma crouching in the yard... I opened the back door and called out. Her face turned to me, almost feral. Black stains covering her face. Her eyes were large with surprise. Jeff, she said before wiping her mouth with her nightgown sleeve. Hey, what's going on? I asked, trying hard not to appear upset. She flopped back into the sitting position, her bare feet dirty and her hands dark with grime. I peered around the yard, seeing little divots all over the grass. Have you been eating dirt? I asked. Her eyes locked on the mine, so confused and innocent. I don't know what happened. I just really wanted it. Um, I felt disgusted. And I saw her now proud stomach protrude out from beneath her nighty. L let me run you a bath. I got the ground beef and the ice cream, I said. And I opened the back door again. I'm sorry. I I don't really want that now. 26th of November, 2016. Gemma hadn't craved anything for the past couple of days, which was a relief, as I had always been away with work. I arrived and was exhausted. There was a note on the sideboard saying that she had already made my lunch, and it was, it was in the fridge. She had spent the day in bed. Surprised, I opened the fridge and I took out a plate of sandwiches. I browsed my phone while I ate. It was nice to have food made for me again. That had been a long time. I gazed at her as she slept. Is that you, Jeff? She asked, turning to stretch, then yawning. I was just watching you sleep, I said, with a big smile on my face. That last, it's the last scan on Monday. Looking forward to it? She nodded with her eyes closed. Large grin covering her face. She stretched again. You need me to get you anything for today? Pickles and cloves? Uh, jelly and hamburgers? She chuckled. No, not today, she replied. Do you mind if I just sleep? Surprised, I responded. Good. Uh, maybe that part of your pregnancy is over. Maybe. She said. Maybe. I love you, Jeff. I love you, too. I began to close the door. I'm just going to walk Ziggy. Oh, he's not here at the moment. He's in my mom's. Really? Your mom hates dogs. She did some grocery shopping for me and offered to look after him until he got back. 
Oh, uh, okay, I said, slightly disappointed. 28th November 2016. The ultrasound of our baby was... It's incredible. You could see its face, its fingers. You could tell it was a girl just by looking at those features. Gemma squeezed my hand so happy and proud. A tear rolled down her face. I'd be lying if I said the same didn't happen to me. Oh, when we returned home, I phoned Gemma's mom. Hi, Helen, I said. Oh, hi, Jeff. How's my gorgeous daughter doing? Very well, thank you. Uh, we just uh, we just had our last scan. Um, she, well, I mean, it looks like a very healthy child. Is it a girl? She said happily. Oh, sorry, we're not supposed to know. Gemma wanted it to be a surprise, but it's, uh, it's obvious. <laughs> Have you thought of a name yet? Uh, no. She doesn't know that I know. <laughs> well, you have to tell her, Helen demanded. But she doesn't want to know, so unless she asks, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> I heard a sigh. Oh, thank you for looking after Ziggy. Uh, do you mind if I pick him up today? I missed the furry little thing. Sorry? Uh, Gem Gemma said that you were looking after him? No such thing. I hate dogs. A chill ran down my spine. Are you sure? Um, she said that you took him when you went grocery shopping for her. I don't know what's up with that girl. I never went shopping for her. I offered. I offered plenty of times, but she had said that she had all the food that she needed. Oh, um, it must be my mistake, I said. Uh, well, that it's, it's good to speak to you again. Likewise, make sure that you kiss my little granddaughter before bed. I will. I said. Gemma was in the living room reading a book. I, um, I don't know how to approach the subject. I didn't want to stress her, you know. Um, hey, I, I was on the phone with your mother. Uh, she says that she's not looking after Ziggy? Gemma stared at me, something vacant in her eyes. Gemma, where is Ziggy? She remained silent as her eyes welled up. He... He ran away when I answered the door to a cold caller. I guess that he thought it was you, and when it wasn't, he just ran off. I'm so sorry. I've been calling the shelters every day. She broke down and cried. I didn't know where to be angry or upset, but seeing her, the mother of my child, I couldn't stay mad at her. Honey, uh, it's okay. That's, I'm sure he's fine, I said, holding back the panic that my little guy was out there somewhere. We cried in each other's arms, and I, I tried to think of other things, things that would make me feel better. Like, can I uh, make you something to eat? Can I get you something? No, no. I've got meat left over from when Mom went shopping for me. I can do that myself. I was about to tell her that her mother hadn't gone shopping for her, but, but I stopped myself. I spent the afternoon phoning shelters to see if Ziggy had turned up. Unfortunately, no one had seen a dog matching the description. Gemma cooked. I sat down at the table as she served dinner. You sure that you're up to this? I asked, admitting after she had spent the last hour slaving over the stove. Yeah, I like cooking for you, and besides, my cravings have gone away. Beef casserole, she said it was. The meat was so tender. Where did you get it? I never had meat like this. Oh, Mom got it from the butcher's when you were away. I smiled and continued to eat. As I finished it, I said, you blew me away with that. <laughs> Let me go wash up. Are you sure? Yeah, that, I mean, it was the best meal I've had since you got pregnant. The least I can do. If that's the case, I'm going to go up to bed. Yeah, you deserve it, I said. I spent the next 15 minutes cleaning the cutlery and the plates. I opened the front door to take the leftovers to the bin, and I lifted the lid and slid the uneaten food into the container. And just before I closed it, something glinted in the light, and I stopped. I took a closer look and reached in. I shivered as my hand touched the day's old food, and... And I pulled it out. I panicked, picking it up. It was Ziggy's collar. I went to the kitchen to clean off the detrius off the dog collar before taking a deep breath and returning to the bedroom. <laughs> Anger consumed me as I held the collar up, wanting to shout at my wife. I did, I did the best that I could to calm myself before asking. What is Ziggy's collar doing in the bin? She pretended to be asleep. Gemma, wake up! I demanded. Hmm... She said, ignoring my question. Did you kill him? She was silent. D did you kill my dog? 
I was hungry, she said, rolling back to her side, covering her head. What? I shouted. Anxiety and panic filled me. What the, what the hell do you mean? It was the cravings, she said, throwing back the covers. You don't know what it's like. What? Is that, is that what I ate tonight? I asked as a reflex. She was silent. And, and the sandwich? Nothing. I, I think I'm going to be sick. Now you know how I feel, she said, shouting at me, tears streaming down her face, her eyes red. I dry heaved over the toilet bowl, heave after heave until the partly digested food finally came up. And I looked at it in the bowl, pieces, pieces, my best friend, gray and mutated. I pulled the flush and looked away. I'm so sorry, Jeff, I couldn't help myself. Where's the rest of him? Did you, did you eat all of him? In the freezer. How much? About a half. 16th December 2016. Some of them looked so forlorn, others really happy to see me, they were just happy to see someone new. Um, what's wrong with this one? I said. He's blind in one eye. Lame, hind leg. I'll take him, I said. You sure? We have plenty of others who are in much better condition. He'll be fine. I filled out the paperwork and the dog was brought out. He limped, pulled against the collar, and choked every time he resisted. Thank you, I said, picking him up. No, thank you, sir. It's a wonderful type of person to look past the disabilities, adopt a dog, so many ailments. I feigned a smile, and I left. The dog pissed himself at the passenger seat as we pulled away. My heart sank. But it's better him than one of the others, I and mean, they could find real families. Once you take care and love them. When we returned home, Gemma was in the living room. I haven't named him, I said. I'm going to go out for a while. I disconnected his lead. He wagged his tail and looked up at me. I ignored him. I shut the door and I drove to the gas station to buy cigarettes. 21st, February 2017. Jim asked when I was going to go back to the pound. I'd been putting her off for weeks. I'd been asking if there was anything else that I could get her. Any? There's this annoying squirrel in the garden if she wants that. But she doesn't. She knows what she wants. I can't go back to the pound. Three dogs in three months. They're going to get suspicious. I seen this one dog running around the streets at night. It looked it looked like it might have belonged to someone at some point. Its toes were painted, but then the way that its fur was, it, it hadn't been cared for in months. Twelfth March, twenty seventeen. Gemma was in some distress. Um I refused to indulge her pika. I couldn't do it anymore. There's too many innocent animals. It had already suffered, and though she cried, I was done. I I had to push past it. There was only two weeks left to go. I told her that I'd get her anything that she wanted apart from that. She wasn't happy. 15th March, 2017. Gemma had cold sweats. She'd been shouting that she thought that she was losing the baby. We had three, three different doctors visit. They said there was nothing wrong with her, that she just needed bed rest. She didn't cry and demand when they were there. They they didn't see it. I was so scared that we'd lose the baby. 19th March, 2017. Gemma had a fever. She refused all food. I called off work, spent time in bed with her, holding her close. I felt the baby kick. She was almost there. You know, she was just, just a couple more days. That's all she needed. 21st March, 2017. A piercing pain woke me in the night. Initially, I thought my arm had fallen asleep, but as I opened my eyes, I saw Gemma on top of me, holding me down, sinking her teeth into my arm. Stop it! That hurts! I cried. But the manacle look in her eyes told me that she wouldn't. I almost passed out as her teeth dug further. She flicked her head back, ripping off a piece of my flesh. She scuttled off the bed and crouched in the corner, munching on my muscle and skin. She, she moaned with pleasure, a peculiar urge being sated. You're crazy! I shouted running into the bathroom, blood pouring from my arm. I wrapped a toilet roll around it until the blood soaked through the paper and it fell away. I grabbed a towel and I held it, re-entering the bedroom. I, I saw that Gemma was asleep on the floor, more peaceful than I've seen her in weeks. 23rd of March, 2017. I had been sleeping in my car. I had my phone on me just in case she needed me. She slept the whole of yesterday and today she wanted to apologize. She rapped on the window of my car and startled me awake. She held her hands together in front of her, pleading with me to forgive her, her muffled voice barely audible through the glass, tears streaming down her cheeks. I was conflicted. I hadn't sought medical attention for my arm. and throbbed. It was only a few days from being due, and I had promised myself I'd do everything that I could to make sure that she was comfortable, except, except allowing her to eat more of me. 
Rationally, I knew that she wasn't... She isn't a cannibal. It was just the cravings that they had to end when she gave birth. They had to. I opened the car door anxiously, and she stood there with her arms out open. I'm sorry, Jeff. I really am, she pleaded. I don't know what got over me. I'm scared. Reluctantly, I embraced her. Her crying stopped as I allowed her to hug me tightly. I kept my distance from her that day. She could tell that I was doing it, and it upset her. You think I'm going to do it again, don't you? She said, waddling over to the dining table, pressing one hand to her lower back. That was the first time I saw her do that. I wonder if it was a show, you know, put on to make me think she was more vulnerable than she was. And when she sat, she winced, made me think it was genuine. Can I get you something to eat? I asked, refusing to advance further than the threshold of the room. No, I'm fine. What have you eaten? Not much, but I'll make do with what we have in the house. So you have no cravings? Not at all. Not at all? Nope. I was suspicious. She had gone long periods of time without them. So you're fine then? Yeah. Okay. I said, looking at my watch. I'm going to call work. I'm going to tell them I'm not coming in. I spent the rest of the day in the living room trying to watch the TV, but having an eye on the doorway. In case Gemma decided to run in. At bedtime, I said I was going to sleep on the couch. But she didn't like it, but didn't put up much of a fuss. As she left, I waited until I could hear the floorboards creak overhead before closing the door. I sat on the couch in the dark, and I stared at the door. I, I couldn't sleep here. There was no lock. I continued to stare, feeling my heart race in my chest. A toilet flushed a few footsteps in the creak of a bed as Gemma got in. I waited another ten minutes, then quietly slid the second couch in front of the door endwise, jamming it against the other couch on the far side of the room, making a furniture T-shape, securing my fort for the evening. I laid down and closed my eyes. My arm throbbed with the beat of my heart, though it didn't take long for my exhaustion. It eventually allowed me to fall asleep. 24th of March, 2017. A delicate rocking woke me. At first I didn't know what it was, and then in the low light I saw the door handle jiggle quietly in the other side of the room. Light strobed in as the door opened and shut gently. Gemma, is that you? I asked, still groggy from sleep. Jeff, can I come in? I'm not sure that's a good idea. I'm your wife. Please let me in. Do you need anything? I'll gladly prepare you some food and bring it up to you. Can you just let me in? No, I said calmly. Jeff, you're pissing me off. She said, her voice slightly raised. The door pressed against the load-bearing couch with force. I got up and held it in place. Hell, Jeff. Damn it, Jeff, let me in. No, calm down and let's talk. She didn't respond, and I sighed with relief. A large thunk and the door opened as Gemma slammed into it with her shoulder. The couch twisted, allowing her to force her head through the opening. Her eyes were wild and maniacal. It lit from the bright light of the hallway. Give me what I need. Give me what the baby craves. Panicking, I pushed the couch back against the door, trying my best not to crush my wife's face. Calm down, Gemma, okay? We, we can get through this, I said, gripping the couch tightly. Just a teeny weeny bit off your gut. I mean, you're fat anyway, Gemma. Gemma. Please, I pleaded. Open this goddamn door! She tried to push her stomach through with no regard for the baby growing inside of her. And I let go of the couch and raced to the door, pushing her back into the hallway. She grabbed my left arm and bit. Ah! I exclaimed, pulling my arm back in the room and slamming the door. I held the handle up and felt her press down in resistance. Gemma, Gemma, let's cool it, okay? Let me get you another dog. I'll, I'll go now. I don't want a dog. I want you. You're my husband. It's right. No! I shouted, pulling the handle up so hard I thought that it would break in my grasp. She screamed in rebellion, her voice shrill with fear and panic. I prayed to a god I didn't know existed that our baby girl would be okay. It was only a few more days, only a few more until this madness was over. I promised I'd be strong enough for the both of us. I didn't know how long it was until she stopped screaming and since she left. It was only when I heard the creaks from above that I, I realized that I could let go. I slid down in front of the door, the side of the couch staring me in the face. My heart felt like it was going to break free from my chest. Small slivers of moonlight crept in through the living room curtains and illuminated the swelling bite mark on my arm. I was relieved to find no flesh missing. I replaced the couch, jamming it in front of the door again. I didn't return to sleep. For five hours I sat, gazing at the handle ready to pounce if it moved again. 
As the sun rose and gradually lit the room through the breaks in the curtain, I, I stood up and I quietly removed the temporary barricade. In the hallway, I called up, Am I there? I heard nothing in response. Seeing the large metal flashlight propped up under the coat hooks, I picked it up, its cold metal heft, asking me if I was willing to use it. I held it anyway, knowing that I wouldn't. I arrived at the top of the stairs and saw the bedroom door stood open. The soft light of the nightlight warmly lit the room in defiance of what I saw. I didn't realize I dropped the flashlight until the dull thud of it hit and my foot made me jump. For the first time in a while, Gemma was peaceful. I mean, I smiled at first, seeing her holding our baby in her arms. The blood distracted me. I've been looking forward to seeing my wife hold our child for as long as I can remember. The taboo that presented itself broke my heart. They were drenched in blood. Her stomach torn asunder. She'd finally satisfied her craving. Our baby didn't cry. She was as silent as my wife. I approached the bed knowing Gemma was no longer going to lunge at me. I closed her eyes gently with my fingers. I wish she could have waited those, those last few days before seeing our child, but she couldn't. Her urge was too strong. If only I let her take it from me, it, it might not have happened. I took a towel from the bathroom and wrapped it around what was left of our child. And I cried. 30th March, 2017. Today is Saturday and I'm exhausted. My arm is in excruciating pain. If anything, the pain's increased in the last few days, I'm not trying not to think about it, but when I look at the bandages, I see the dried blood and the yellow ring that's crusted around the edge, and I don't want to take it off and check. I know it's bad, and it's going to get worse. I rock my baby in the cradle side to side. She's sleeping so soundly. I did my best to swaddle her, but the... this is the third time the blood still seeps through. If I squint, I can pretend she's just, she's just sleeping. And I give myself a few more hours before I make the call. The fix is barely masking the smell from the bed now. The one next to us. Sleep well, my little baby girl. Sleep well. I'm breaking every NDA on the planet by posting this, and I don't think things will, will ever go well for me once it's out. That doesn't matter, though. So all that matters is that you believe me. Those shiny new AirPods you got all sleek and slim and white as fresh bone. Yeah, you need to stop using them. No, to be safe, you should throw them away and burn them, hurl them into the ocean or bury them deep in a lockbox full of salt. I know the thought of tossing out those tiny little slices of the future that you wear in your ears is painful, but it must be done. If you don't listen to me, if you keep your AirPods... Soon you'll start to hear, you'll start to hear terrible whispers. That is, if you aren't hearing them already. I'm sure I sound crazy. At first I thought, maybe I was going insane. That, that would be a far more comfortable scenario than what's really happening. I thought working at Apple would be my dream job. For a few months, it truly was. Life was like some, some high-tech minimalist fairy tale. Everything was bright and polished. Everyone I worked with was sharp and brilliant. The cafeteria food was amazing. And then, then one day, about four months after I started at Apple, I stumbled upon some dead code. It was just a few orphan lines in a massive briar patch of an update. Blink and even a skilled coder would miss the anomaly. It was pure luck that I spotted the quirk. I reported the dead code to my supervisor, who assured me that he'd kick the issue up the ladder and it would be patched. I offered to work on the reconfiguration myself, but was politely, firmly, told to not worry about it. I've always been burdened with more curiosity than common sense, so I promptly ignored my supervisor's instructions and I began to dig. I ended up digging myself right into a coding mass grave. There are lines of dead code in every Apple update that we've ever put out goes all the way back to the beginning. As far as I can tell, on their own, each errant string is harmless. Stack them all together, though, and there's something wrong about the pattern. Something horrible and hungry. Something that seems to be... to be on the verge of waking up. My first guess was that it was a hidden message. Probably subliminal advertising. 
You'd be listening to the latest Taylor Swift song, and right as she hits that chorus, some elusive voice chimes in to tell you that Chick-fil-A always has the cure for whatever you're craving. It'd be slimy if that was Apple's plan, but hardly the first use of underhanded marketing in America. I mean, I wish advertising was all that it was. It's far worse. My initial guess was half right. To start hearing hidden messages through your AirPods, but it won't be a subtle nudge to buy chicken. It'll be whispers. So soft you might think it's your imagination. Well, these whispers will make beautiful promises. They'll tell you stolen secrets, offer you every desire submerged into the darkest depths of your heart. Yet all of that will come to a horrific price. The whispers will make you do things, hurt things, yourself and other people. I don't know why, I don't know how, but, but if I'm reading the code correctly, you'll start to feel a push. An urge to damage the, the fragile thing that you love most. How could this have gone unnoticed for so long? The irregular code is hard to find, sure, but someone must have caught on at least once. Did they go to their supervisor just like I did? Did they, did they listen when they were inevitably instructed to let it go? Or did they go digging like I did? Digging until they dug themselves a six by six hole before they were buried along with their curiosity. I know right now you're still skeptical. I understand. I really do. See, AirPods are, are expensive. They're chic. More of a personal statement than a gadget. They're like earrings if, if Ray Bradbury designed jewelry. I mean, maybe your AirPods were a Christmas gift from a friend or a significant other. I don't, I don't expect you to only take my word for it. All I want you to do is keep an open mind, more importantly, an open ear. The whispers will be difficult to catch. The voices will be woven into your songs, your podcasts, your audiobooks. That's the terrible efficiency of Apple. Now that you know what to look for, though, you might be able to pin down a whisper like a, like a butterfly to a board. Even if you can't notice the voices, be on the lookout for unexplained violent urges. Set the sentry of your mind on guard against intrusive thoughts. If you feel your fingers linger on the throat of your, of your child while you're fixing their collar, then you, you know I was right. If you find yourself wondering exactly what shade of red your lover's lifeblood would be, you need to act immediately. I don't know why Apple wants us to rip the world apart. It could be a social experiment for the government. However, when I found the strings of dead code and, and I fit the pieces of the puzzle together, one on top of another, I see strange and revolting designs. The symbols look ancient, twisted, and squirming like no one, like no other coding language I've ever seen before. It hurts my eyes to look at if I stare for too long. The higher-ups here are on to me. I mean, maybe they, they were watching me from the beginning, but I don't think they expected me to move so quickly. I've barricaded myself in my office. They're, they're trying to force the door, and it doesn't look like it'll hold for much longer. The frame shudders with each impact. But it should last long enough for me to post this, though. One warning, at least. And once the warning is out, I've done all I can. I'm not sure what'll happen to me when they get in. I'm scared. But this was the right choice, the only choice. So don't let it be for nothing. Put away your AirPods. If you don't believe the danger, at least listen carefully. Search for the whispers. And whatever you do, whatever you do, don't believe anything they tell you. Don't accept anything they offer. Listen for them. But don't let them in. When my daughter, Tabitha, first spoke, I was ecstatic, and so was my wife. I was getting worried as she'd hit that age, and every day that passed, and she didn't, she didn't speak. It was, it was one more day of anxiety. Fast forward three and a half years, and it was my job to explain to Tabitha what had happened to her mother. I'd left it for a few days, not knowing how to explain it. I'd been psyching myself up, but I couldn't do that to her, so I couldn't tell. I couldn't tell her that her mother was gone. So on a quiet evening, I sat with her watching TV. She said, can Erica stay? Who? I asked. She pointed to her right, to the empty space on the floor next to her. 
It was a reflection of my own childhood, and a tingle of fear crept up my back, like wayward hands going for the throat. I smiled back at her, if only only person I knew that could help. My sister Tammy wasn't loved by my mother. Um, I didn't understand that at the time. My father had been in a car accident. He had been driving back from work late. I remember the days that Mom and Dad argued, her asking if he could do less hours. He said he needed to do them, that there would be no one else who could. Now, my dad loved Tammy, even more than me, I think. He didn't like that she slept on the floor next to my bed, but Mom insisted. I'm not getting that thing a bed, my mom said once, so loud that I could hear it through the floor. I cut my hands over Tammy's ears and whispered to her that everything would be fine. He'd fallen asleep and drifted off the motorway. They speculated that he woke when he hit the rumble strips on the side of that uh, hard shoulder. There were 60 feet of skid marks that weaved from left to right until his vehicle lost all momentum instantly. We didn't see Dad after that. Mom didn't tell us to start with. I guess she thought knowing the truth would somehow make life worse. We couldn't heal. We couldn't move on. Mom took it out on Tammy. Make your sister behave, she'd say. I don't want to see her in this house, she demanded. Keep her in your room. She disgusts me. Without Dad there to defend her, and me only 13 years old, I kept quiet. I'd known about her anger. I, it didn't take me long to figure out Dad wasn't coming back. The rumors spread quickly at school. Within, within days, children were asking what it was not to have a dad. I told them that he was coming back. Though they just laughed. Then they stopped teasing, and a teacher explained to me what had happened. I was numb. He was on a work trip, my mother said. She said he'd be back. I felt like an idiot. I was 13, and I didn't know what death was. It reminded me of when I was in, in year 10, and thunder growled above the school fields. It began to run inside before my friend Darren said that there was nothing to worry about. It was only clouds bumping together. We laughed at him like they laughed at me. I didn't understand how hurtful it must have been to him, but this was about my dad, and my sister was the only person who showed any sign of sympathy, because we shared it. Tammy was upset. She told me that she felt so lonely. She asked if, if she wished hard enough, would he come back? I told her it wasn't possible. Why? It doesn't work like that, I said. I could see the tears well up in her eyes. Maybe, though, if you try really hard, I said. And she smiled. That was all I wanted, a smile. Selfishly, though. As I could worry less about her and concentrate more on my own grief. Mom screamed one morning and thumped up the stairs. Tammy jumped off the bed. She didn't want Mom to catch her sleeping on the mattress. She had to sleep on the floor. She shuffled under the bed with practice. Who did this? Mom blasted, pushing her way into the room so hard I thought the door would fly off the hinges. She dangled the bloody carcass of our of our pet rabbit, Peter. I, um... Uh, I remember how its eyes were still open with fright. Its white fur spotted with flecks of blood. I didn't do it, I swear, I said. Who was it then? She said quicker. A vein throbbed in her forehead, as if it were the thing demanding answers. Was it your sister? Where is it? It was me, I said, not wanting her to hurt Tammy. I shut my eyes and I braced myself, feeling my body grow stiff and the tension almost shattered me. When I opened my eyes, Mom was gone. Moments later, Tammy edged herself out from under the bed, her eyes red from tears. I'm not mad, I said, but why did you do it? It wasn't me, it was Bobby. Who's Bobby? He's my friend. I looked around the room, seeing no one. Is, is he here now? She was now kneeling on the makeshift bed next to mine. She nodded. Where is he? She pointed to the closet. I hopped off the bed and made my way over. I need to talk to him. Is, is that okay? No! He doesn't like other people. Only me. 
The cupboard had those slat wood doors, so I tried to peer in to see if any eyes shined back at me. If he's in there, how did he kill Peter? We were downstairs. He didn't mean to, Danny pleaded. He tried to hug him, and Peter started kicking. He was only trying to calm him. I wanted to tell Tammy that Bobby wasn't real, that it must have been her that did it. I couldn't do that to her so soon after losing Dad. I think it's best that you stay up here. I'll go talk to Mom, I said. In the weeks following my father's death, it felt as though I was forced to grow up. It was my job. No, it was my duty to look after Tammy and to keep my mom away from her. It wasn't her fault that Dad was dead. When I got downstairs, Mom sat at the dining room table with a glass of red wine. Peter lay in the center of the table. What am I supposed to do with this? She asked calmly. I don't know, Mom. It wasn't you, was it? She stated. Yes, it was. Stop lying for her! I'm not. I can tell you're lying. I'm your mother. I hung my head. Please don't hurt her, I pleaded. She scoffed. What use would that do? I don't know what you did, but your dad... She trailed off. I don't know what you mean. Killing an animal is serious. Shows there's something wrong with her. Don't you see that? I shook my head. Jesus, it's not hard. She picked up Peter and shook him. I could see that she saw the grimace I pulled. Killing animals is wrong. I should have kept my mouth shut, but it was my duty. It was my duty to protect Tammy. We eat meat every day. I saw her face go red. She didn't explode. She didn't say anything. But you should go to school. I'm hungry. We have rabbit. Can't let that go to waste. I went to school without eating. Over the next few days, I smelled something odd in my bedroom. First, it smelled sweet. Then it disappeared. Then the next day, rotten. Tammy was playing on the floor when I approached the closet. Through the wood slats, I smelt it. It was coming from in there. I reached for the handle. Don't go in there. Bobby won't like it, Tammy said. Can you smell that? Yeah, huh? It's disgusting. Bobby wanted to play with Peter. What? He's dead. Bobby doesn't know that. I pulled the closet door open and flies flew out. I shielded my face. No, Tammy pleaded. There was nothing in there. Except for the decomposing corpse of Peter Rabbit. I heaved. Get me a bag. Bobby says to leave it. He He's telling him he's sorry. Bobby, is it real? I shouted. And as soon as I did, I regretted it. Tammy stood up and ran out of the room. Luckily, it was Thursday, and Mom had already put out the bins to the curb. When I heard Mom go to bed, I gave myself half an hour, for I crept downstairs and outside, placing Peter into the bin. Goodbye, buddy, I said. And for the first time in weeks, I felt myself begin to cry. Then I thought about Dad, and all the grief I'd been storing up flowed out. It's one of those silent cries where well, you don't want anyone to know. I stopped when I turned back to the house. The light was still on in my room and I could see Tammy stare out watching me. I didn't want her to see that. Next to her, a silhouette around a foot taller than her. When I returned to the bedroom, Tammy was already tucked in. I didn't undress when I got into bed. I was scared. I saw Bobby. I said with the covers pulled over my head. Yes, you did. Tammy replied. I told you he's real. I realized I had no place to be arguing with her. Where is he now? He said he didn't want to go back into the closet. I felt my breathing quicken as a fright I didn't know possible began to take hold. Where is he, Tammy? He's under your bed. I felt myself hyperventilate. 
A hand touched my shoulder. I pulled back the covers to reveal Tammy's smiling face next to me. Don't worry. He likes you. I didn't see Bobby up close then. Tammy said he was shy, and I was happy about that. I put it down to a hallucination, a trick of the light, lack of sleep, stress, grief. The list was endless. It was rare to see Mom without a glass of wine after the rabbit incident. I'm sure she was grieving the loss of our dad, but that was the tipping point. I think he was the only thing keeping the family together, and with her irrational hatred of my sister, she was gone. Lost in alcohol. Mom no longer picked me up from football practice, so I stopped going. I wasn't too bothered. There was a, a divide between me and the other players after Dad died. They treated me as the kid without a father. Instead of giving me support, they kept me away with jokes and jibes. On the day it all changed, I knew something was wrong. The front door was wide open. I could see it from down the street. I walked normally, then quicker again as something inside of me knew. It was odd. The house felt cold. It was as if the life inside had been snuffed out. Who are you? I asked the man who stood in the living room. He was around six feet tall, wearing a black sweater, black gloves, and a balaclava that covered his face. Rucksack sat on the floor next to him. I didn't do it, he said, his voice wavering. I swear. He pushed past me, setting me tumbling to the floor. I didn't see where he went. My eyes were concentrated on the trail of blood that ran to the kitchen. I didn't want to get up at first. I knew if I did, I'd follow the tracks and find out what it was. Mom? I shouted, hoping to hear a response. Tammy? I shouted again. I heard crying. I pushed myself to my feet, feeling my legs give way. As the anxiety of the situation took hold, I remembered my heart thumping so hard in my chest that it was it was as if it spoke to me, saying, uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. As I approached the kitchen, I saw Tammy first. She was standing, still in her nightgown, her hands over her mouth as if to keep out the scene. She stared out in front of her. She saw me. He didn't mean to hurt her. He was trying to protect her from the man. Who, oh, Tammy, who did this? Bobby! she said, and then burst into tears. On the floor, a small glass leaked a puddle of Charlotte wine and mixed with the blood that ran from my mother. Mom, I said, running and slipping on the liquid. Phone the ambulance! Tammy was frozen on the spot with her fear. I heard creaks from upstairs and Tammy's eyes met mine. I knew who it was. I reached for the kitchen phone, and I, I called on the line and hugged my mother. I expected her body to get colder, but it didn't. I placed my ear to her chest, hoping to hear a pulse. I didn't cry. I felt numb. They didn't tell me what happened to my mother. Only that she was brave. And she confronted an intruder that I should have, that I should be proud of her. I was taken to live with my aunt and uncle. When I asked them where Tammy was, they were always nice. They said they only ever heard good things about her. But she had gone to stay with another family. When I asked why, they didn't give me an answer. When I asked if I could talk to her, they said someday. But not today. It was only when I turned 24 when I found her again. I... Moved out as soon as I could, age 17. It wasn't that my aunt and uncle weren't nice people. I mean, they were. But it never felt like home. It always felt like if I were biding my time until I could get out. I tried so hard to find her through Facebook and other family members. Those who did remember her remembered her as a very young child. Had no clue as to where she was. When I finally saw her, I was sitting in a cafe drinking coffee. She was outside. She walked hand in hand with the man I thought I recognized. I raced out and she spotted me instantly and greeted me with a powerful embrace. She introduced me to her boyfriend, Robert. He was older than me, around 10 years. I thought it was good that she had an older boyfriend. She needed someone who could be a quasi-father figure to her. Do I know you? I said as I took his hand. I don't think we've met before, he said, shaking my hand. We exchanged information. And kept in touch. 
I was anxious before she answered the phone. And when she did, she was too. I asked her how her day was, and she seemed preoccupied. What's wrong? I asked. I knew you were going to phone. I told Robert. He's looking at me in the way that you used to look at me. Remember when we were kids? You let me sleep in your bed? You always made me feel so safe. I do. We were both quiet for a moment. Spit it out, she responded. It's Tabitha. How's she getting on? She's fine, um, but she mentioned something today that reminded me of you. Oh? Yeah, she's got this friend. That's nice. It's always good to have friends. No, no, she's, um, she's not real. And I sighed, remembering telling Tammy about Bobby. She says her name is Erica, I continued. Is she happy? Yeah. So what's the problem? I don't want to have her, you know, have to cope with grief with an imaginary friend. Have you not told her what happened? I hadn't. How could I? How could I tell my child what happened to her mother? I could barely face it myself. No. You really should. It would help so much. I will do, but... What should I do in the meantime? Play along? Work for you? It didn't. I told you Bobby didn't exist, but you insisted. She let out an anxious laugh. And you remember how that ended? When someone wants something so badly, but people don't accept it. You can't stop it. Your anger only fuels it. What's created isn't wanted. I don't understand. Oh, honey... I love you so much. You looked out for me much longer than you needed to. What do you mean? You and Dad couldn't let go. The love you felt for me was so consuming you forgot about it completely. Mom didn't. She grieved. She let go. Why do you think it was so hard for her to see me around the house? The room began to spin. As a memory I knew I had that had pushed away to the darkest reaches of my mind, tucked away under the bed and forgotten about, came to the surface. You remember, don't you? Tammy said with a melancholia to her voice. I did. You were in the bath. It wasn't Dad's fault. It was my heart. The whole thing flashed before my eyes. Dad running out of the bathroom screaming, Mom asking what was wrong, me walking into the bathroom to see Tammy's body float face down in the bath. Dad telling me that everything was going to be okay. Tammy was only going to the hospital for the night. She'd be back in the morning. You came back, though. Dad and I greeted you at the door. I did. I don't understand. You and Dad wanted me back so much. I'm going to have to go now. Please don't, I pleaded with Tammy. I have to. It's time. I love you. I love you too, big brother. The static hiss took over the phone line and was replaced with a dial tone. Frantically, I punched in the numbers again. I wanted to hear it ring, but instead it was just... I was just greeted with, I'm sorry, this number is no longer in service. I sat next to Tabitha as she was she was saying how much fun she was going to have with Erica. She asked if she could stay for the weekend. I took a deep breath and I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry she can't. I need to tell you something about your mommy. When is she coming home? She asked. Yeah, uh, It's about that. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and thank you for watching tonight's video. I want to talk to you about one quick thing uh, before we get into the real outro here, uh, and that's going to be the Australian fires that are currently taking place. Uh, I'm pretty sure everybody has seen on their social media or on the news or what have you about what's 
taking place in Australia right now. The fires are raging out of control. There's something like 1.5 million acres that are currently on fire. It's pushing animals towards extinction, forcing people out of their homes. Many of them YouTubers and other uh, creepypasta narrators um, that you probably listen to here. Um, but one thing that actually kind of gets to me is that there's there's a lot of awareness about what's taking place down there. There's a lot of photos and videos I'm pretty sure that you've all seen, but nobody's really talking about where you can go to to be able to donate, uh, to be able to help um, either firefighters or relief funds or anything like that. And that's what I want to try to bring to you guys, or at least have you guys try to share around, even if you're not able to donate. If you look in the description down below, there's four different links there uh, that I'm going to have on the videos for the next couple of weeks. Um, and hopefully we can, and we, I mean... <laughs> all of you uh, can be able to um, share this around and all of us together can be able to actually get some more eyes on where we can be able to go to help. I mean, yeah, we're a group of people that likes horror stories, horror movies, horror, what have you. But um, I think one thing we can do that's at least powerful for us is we have the ability to minimize the amount of horror in real life. Uh, so thank you guys so much for watching or listening. If you're listening to this on the podcast available on Spotify and on Apple and on SoundCloud and on Google or wherever you get your podcasts from, or if you're listening on the podcast, then thank you for watching on YouTube and subscribing to Mr. Creepypasta. And a very big thank you to my patrons from patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta, such as Dr. Strawberry, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Chumpinski. Brianna Ventine Jensen, Stephanie Van Huss, Tristan Pelton, G Weevil 3, Diane Krauss, Asia, the Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Nico Kyle, Caleb Dugall, Daniel Polson, Dante Rao, The Last Blade Song, The Ginger Bros, Don Mewmeister, Eliminator 86, Nebsky, Sky Harbor, Finley, Steampunk Center, Rafael Rodriguez, and Optimistic Avocado. You guys are the MVPs and everybody down there in the description. A big thank you to you guys as well. Sweet dreams, everybody.